So hello and happy Friday. Today is Friday, March the 26th, last Friday in March. Next Friday will be April, of course. And this is episode number 103 of Backyard Beekeeping Questions and Answers. So guess what's going on outside today? Well, the temperature dropped like crazy and it is gusting winds of 54 miles per hour, which is 89 kilometers per hour. It has dropped from 70 degrees Fahrenheit to 37 degrees Fahrenheit, which is three degrees Celsius, roughly. So if you wanna know what we're gonna talk about today, the questions were submitted over the past week through YouTube, Facebook, and a variety of other emails and things like that. So they're gonna be down in the description below here. You can also join us on Podbean, The Way to Be. It's a podcast, so you can listen to it while you do other things. You don't have to look at the screen to understand what's going on today. So what else? Join us on Facebook, there's a link down below. And by the way, on Podbean, it's the way to be, and this is the way to be. So I'm glad you're here. Welcome if you're new, thank you for coming back if you've seen it before. Let's jump right in because we have a lot to cover today. Alan Weebelhaus, I'm guessing. Sorry if I got that wrong. Hi Fred, have you had a chance to open the Long Langs Hive? I'm getting ready to put a three pound package in a Long Lang and it depends on your report. Yikes, you know, I said yikes for me, it's not in the question because depending on my report is, you know, whether you're gonna go ahead don't depend on me. I'm brand new to horizontal hive beekeeping. So I did my long Langstroth hive. I put it out there. Everything looked great. I put a package of Saskatraz bees in there last spring. I showed that video. We did the uh, intermediate checks during the year. Everything's looking great. I love the entrance. I love the setup. I even put the two inch rigid styrofoam boards in the roof of it through wintertime too, just in case added buffer even though there was already one inch oak and everything else. But I'm sorry to say my bees did not make it. Now that's no slam on the horizontal format. There are horizontal beekeepers, long Langstroth hives are nothing but the standard Langstroth hive that extends sideways. I have thoughts about that by the way, because the bees for some reason didn't want to go frame to frame and expand through there's another question later on today that, that asks along these same lines. They're having issues with it. We'll talk more, but uh, I think in some ways, the orientation of the comb has something to do with it, because what are we doing? We're putting in these Langstroth frames, which I like, by the way, because standard frame that goes into all the other hives, these deep frames, and I put a bunch of dimensions on them, 19 inches long. This is the height the interior space, the bottom piece, interior dimensions, and so on. So anyway, we spec it all out because we built our long Langstroth hive, at least I built mine, based on bee space out from these dimensions. And I left a little larger space at the bottom, which turned out to be a good idea. We'll talk more about that later too, but my bees are dead. They're dead. They did have mites. We got the mites under control because we did oxalic acid vaporization on them and the mite counts. Dropped them right down to about 1%. Three bee, or three mites out of 300 bees sampled. Everything is looking great. They're loaded with honey. They had everything. In fact, the final uh, look, see, that we did, put a video camera in there and pulled the frames one by one, and the population was great. Lots of eggs, lots of brood, lots of honey stored. They went into winter with about 60 pounds of honey, and they didn't use it all. They went like halfway across. We're gonna talk more about it, but the way the entrance with those frames, because one of the justifications that I had, I know I'm kind of scattered right now on this. One of the justifications I had for the horizontal format working out great was when I see these rip outs going on and they're in the floor joists and things like that. If you have two by 10 floor joists, that's not even a 10 inch depth, by the way. And my long Langstroth eye was composed of two by 12s which is nice and deep. And I even, the plan this year was to go even deeper. I'm up in the air whether I'm even gonna build another one right now, or if I'm gonna try again with the same one. One of the things that would have remedied 
the problem of the cluster not seeming to be able to move without exposing themselves to cold and, you know, not continuing to move on to the frames of honey that would sustain them while they develop their small brood cluster. When I'm looking at these ripouts of these, these long, narrow areas, what is the orientation of the comb? Because this is interesting. Jeff Horshaw, Mr. Ed, um, I like to see his ripouts because he gets all excited. Well, he's excited about everything anyway. But he gets excited when he gets these really long, continuous combs that he pulls out three feet, four feet long. Well, my long Langstroth hive is five feet long. If I didn't have to have that limitation of that long Langstroth frame, and if it were oriented parallel with the long axis of my horizontal hive instead of perpendicular, then the bees would follow continuous rows of comb as they work their way across the honey without having to leave the frame they're on and move on to the next frame, which is what we asked them to do. We also know that in the Langstroth design, the standard box that we stack the hives one on top of the other, they tend to move up and onto the immediately adjacent frame directly above. They're very resistant to moving over sideways and using, that's why we find those outer frames of honey Although the ones to the east and the south, southeast corner of the hives, they tend to migrate there and use those resources while the cold side is the western side, or for you, wherever you are, wherever the sun sets. So they move up and they like to stay continuous on those resources. For the horizontal format, if we had really long frames, which we don't have right now, but if we did, they would follow that connected frame and just migrate across it because they never leave the frame. They're always on the honey. And that's why I think when they find those feral colonies and cavities like that, those long cavities, that's why they make it. Because they're often in abandoned buildings, abandoned structures, sheds, things like that. There's no heat. There's no resource in there that keeps them warmer than the outside other than getting them out of the wind. And that's what we do with our big, heavy duty, long laying straw hives. I'm not giving up. I just might not be making another one yet this year. I might though too. I'm up in the air. But that's the first thought I have because they got stuck right there and they seem to start with brood and then they die out on the brood. So we're going to talk about that more because there's another question, but please don't do this. It depends on your report. There are people with it configured exactly the way I have it configured. And their bees made it. So what's the percentage? I don't know. For me, it's 100% failure, but that's only because I only have one of them. Maybe if I had five of them, three out of five would have made it or something like that. This is a rough year for a lot of beekeepers. A lot of beekeepers in my area are reporting heavy losses. So not just the horizontal hive. But I'm sticking with the format along with multiple other formats, just like the lands hive that I just painted up that's ready to go out there. We're going to move on to that, but I think it's the, the nature of the frame orientation and the fact that the bees have to leave frames and go to the others uh, that is one of the limiting things. I did use foundationless frames and I used better comb, all of which can be chewed and modified and reshaped by the bees and they had horizontal corridors going right through the comb into the next frame and so on. So they could have moved, they just didn't. And the kick of it, too, was we had like one break, one decent day, late January, whatever. They were all flying. So they were still alive right up until the middle of January. What a rip. Anyway, the next question is, so, yeah, still try it. Don't, you know, base that off of me. You might have better bees. They might handle it better. Something like that. This is from Aberland. Question on woodenware. So we say that the bee space is three-eighths of an inch. That's true, and that was developed by Lorenzo Langstroth. Bee space. On the top and the bottom of each box is a three-eighths inch space built in. Which would mean that when the boxes are stacked, they're actually 
is a three quarter inch gap between the frames vertically, which contributes to all the extra comb they build and the pupae that gets torn apart when the hives are opened up. Generally, the pupae torn apart in those gaps is drone pupae or larvae if it's still open. Anyway, any reason not to shave off the 3 16ths in from the top and the bottom of each box uh, to maintain the proper bee space and cut down on the comb built. I would maintain the original dimension on the brood box for the drones on the bottom. I also use a slatted rack, which goes, you have the bottom board, slatted rack, then your brood box, which would help at the bottom. Okay, so here's the thing. Why do we have that space between those frames? Yeah, the other first thing is shaving off the top and bottom of a box I think is a bad idea because the top has that rabbit joint in there. So if you're going to leave one, I would leave the top unaltered and cut away from the bottom for the space to the box below because then you would maintain a 3 8 inch, three eighths inch space. And where, what's magic about 3 eighths of an inch anyway? Well, based again on... Reverend Langstroth's examinations, if it was a space bigger than three-eighths of, of an inch, as described here, they put burr comb, brace comb, uh, extra comb in there, sometimes really large, oblong, weirdly shaped cells, and they even keep honey stores in there, which is also why when we pull our boxes off, you get a bunch of dripping honey, and depending on the time of year when you do that, what happens? Well, all the bees around smell the honey, and they come over and they start feeding on that. So you can actually kick off a robbing situation if it's during a dearth that you tear these things open. So the other thing is, so the larger space they fill with comb, a smaller than three-eighths of an inch space. What do they do with that? They seal it up with propolis. Propolis, propolis, tomatoes, tomatoes. So because they seal up the smaller space, that 3 eighths of an inch space turned out to be the ideal. So, but here's the reason that that space is of utility value for those who are keeping bees. What are the things people like to do on the top of their brood box, right on top of the brood frames? Well, early spring this year, people like to put patties on there. Notice that this is still here, that we've missed our window of opportunity to feed the bees. I still have my natural apiary pollen bee patties. These things were very expensive and didn't use them because the bees are bringing in resources on their own, different story. But anyway, it's a space where people put fondant or they put uh, mountain camp sugar. It's a fancy name for putting a piece of newsprint on top of your brood frame, sprinkling dry sugar on it and then putting your box or inner cover on top of that and so on. So the space accommodates that. If you don't have that, and some people complain about the limit of that space even now. Some of the pollen patties come, they're pretty darn thick. One of the problems a lot of people had, because they got the feedback, those uh, spirulina patties, they're really firm. So when you put those on the back of the frames, if they're not scraped clean, so when we're inspecting our hives and there's burr comb on the top of the backs of these frames, we take our hive tools and we scrape them down clean to maintain that space. And the space we're talking about is on the top of the frame on the box below, the space between that and the bottom of the frame on the box that we put on above it. So if we have enough of a space, then you have room to put your patty in there to feed the bees. So you do actually have a utility aspect to that. Also, some people use things like Formic Pro, Formic Acid. And they use that to treat for varroa mites. So you also need a space for that too. So if we eliminate these spaces, maybe A, you're treatment free. Or you follow Dr. Leo, uh, Dr. Leo Sherishkin, the horizontalhive.com guy, the editor for the book, Beekeeping with a Smile, who would have you not feeding, not treating, not doing anything for your bees really, except for picking and working with the survivors. And uh, so he may say that there's no need for a space like that. But every other, you know, beekeeper, if you're ever going to treat for mites when you see that you have them, you're going to have to have oxalic acid vaporization would not require that space. So you're out. So the utility aspect really comes in when you're going to feed or supplement or treat by some material that requires the use of that space. So I recommend not removing the space, not modifying your boxes, 
because I like to maintain interchangeability of those boxes. So we don't want some to be really compressed and short and some to be longer and everything else. The other thing as your hive boxes get older, they show a lot of wear and tear on those mating surfaces where the boxes come together. So leave that extra material on there. I highly recommend it because one of the things I'm doing this year is getting on the table saw and just shaving that mating edge down because it's a little round, it's a little irregular as it's weathered through the years and the boxes don't mate well anymore. So they're, they're kind of, there's little gaps and variations in it that we can take care of by planing or shaving that down so that all the corners match and the boxes sit level on one another. So I don't recommend getting rid of that space. What's the damage that you're doing if you leave the space and the bees use it for bird comb and things like that? Just as I described, you're gonna pull apart some drone comb for the most part. So you see the little white, you know, people panic because you pull the box apart and oh, I killed a bee and there's little white larvae, but there's some comfort in knowing that those are most often drones. And uh, the other thing is, of course, the honey, which the bees reclaim right away. In fact, some people suggest that if it is a sensitive time of year where honey scent in the air would be detrimental, in other words, it's going to draw unwanted attention from wasps because they want honey all the time. And of course, other honeybees that might rob you out. So if it's a weaker colony. So what some suggest is that you shift the box around, you pull it, you break it a little bit. And once you see that there's broken honey cells, close it right back up and go on to do inspections on your other hives and come back to it. And that gives the resident bees time to clean up those leaks and stuff and clean up the broken cells. They won't refill them right away. And the next time you pull it off, there's no dripping, leaking honey everywhere. The other thing is I highly recommend you bring a Tupperware tub with you. And when you're scraping off the tops of those frames and stuff, it would be better if I were demonstrating this, right? But we're going to describe it. Put it right in your tubs that have lids so you can close them up and again keep them away from other bees and now you're harvesting some honey and wax that you can use later if you want to so that's my answer for that i would not modify it question number three tim martin olathe kansas Okay, Tim from Haven Park Apiary in Olathe, Kansas. I've been listening and watching here for a few years now. You have talked at length about not using a queen excluder with your flow hives and in turn using a hunter bridge to prevent the queen from entering your flow super. My confusion is this. If I put a medium above the brood box for the purpose of making a honey bridge, what is preventing the queen from expanding her brood into your intended honey bridge? Nothing. <laughs> That's, the short answer is nothing. That's why this is one of those do as I say, not as I do kind of things because I'm very careful when I explain that uh, I use the honey bridge, especially with these flow hives, um, because I found that putting a queen excluder in there will slow things down. In fact, it slowed down the, the bees' preparation of the flow supers, the flow plastic frames that are mechanized and everything. They have to seal everything up. But what I found was when I set up the brood frame, the brood box, and once that's full, and once they do a medium super, by the way, if they arc up into that and they have brood into that second box also, that's not a honey bridge yet. So then I put a third box on, and when that gets full of honey and there's no brood in that box, that's my honey bridge. And then what happens is, and you see this in feral colonies and everything else, the bees set up their brood area. The brood has an arc of it um, also that will be pollen, stored pollen and resources. And then we get into nectar that's unripe and we get into capped honey and things like that. So it's this big, like a sunrise uh, appearance. And once they do that, it's extremely rare to look at a feral frame, a feral comb and see the queen skip over all those layers because that is the most practical use of their resources, time, and energy. So for example, once they establish that brood area and it might spread through multiple frames in your brood box, once they establish it, it's rare for them to change it. We're the ones that get in there and mess it up and change it around on them. Why is it rare for them to change it? Because once it's established, your brood only gets so big, only occupies so many frames or so many combs, you know, segments of comb. 
And then uh, what they do is they're constantly, they're hatching out in the middle, nice little circle, and they hatch in a perimeter going out from there in radius. And then what happens is the queen is laying eggs right behind him, so now the cycle continues. So it's just like hatching out in little, if we saw, you know, a time-lapse photo of it, they would expand out, expand out, and then contract, expand, and contract, expand, and contract, and so on. So they don't actually lay a bunch of brood up here, lay a bunch of brood over there. The most distant cells that the queen will lay her eggs in are generally drone comb, drone brood. So what are the risks when you don't use a queen excluder? Well, it's 100%. The risk is that the queen goes up there and lays where you don't want her to lay. What do you do to stop that? You use a queen excluder. <laughs> so, I mean, I get away with it, but I'm also accepting the fact that I might open one of my upper boxes at any time and see that the queen has laid her eggs up there. Rare. It can happen. I did experiments leaving flow supers on because originally when the, they designed that and those flow frames came out, uh, people said, well, those are too deep anyway. The queen won't lay in them. Uh, the cells are so big. There's only going to be drones in there. So I did experiments on that. I let them go up in there. I let them use the whole thing all through the wintertime. And the queen did lay drones in there. She also laid workers. Uh, she used those plastic cells, nice and deep, too deep for the queen. And uh, she laid eggs and they did brood and everything. And then they all migrated back down to the lower boxes as spring came. So even that uh, flow super was not ruined by that. And interestingly enough, the bees cleaned out the cells. So my bottom line lesson for you is if you do not use a queen excluder below the honey supers where you plan to use the honey for your consumption or for honey production or anything else, you accept the risk. This is why commercial beekeepers don't even play this game because they can't have eggs and larvae showing up in their extracted honey. They can't. It's a fail. But a backyard beekeeper can look at the frames. Can pull them up and see, oh, there's brood in that one, darn it, you know, leave that one alone and only pull the frames that are pure honey without any brood in them. Now, what encourages the queen to lay eggs beyond that established deep bottom two brood boxes? Usually it's a deep and a half. That's how we arrive at the deep and then a medium super to contain all of that and above that would be honey. Uh, if you put upper entrances in your hives, you added ventilation up at the top of the hive. Where does the queen instinctively want to put her eggs? Near ventilation. So if you have no top ventilation, no upper entrance, there's air up there that is often low, high in CO2, low in oxygen, Sometimes high dampness. All of these things, by the way, are unappealing to what? Varroa destructor mites. So it ties in. But the queen wants to instinctively place her eggs down near the main entrance. We're also going to talk a little bit more about that today. But that's where the airflow and the air exchange is the most efficient and the easiest. Again, the least amount of energy consumed by the bees to perform those functions. If she's laying her eggs way up in the top of the box, midsummer, beginning of a nectar flow, it would make no biological sense for her to do that. Unless the beekeeper came in and established an upper vent, established an upper entrance, and created an air exchange up there which facilitated putting brood right there so that then it could be better vented. But the heat loss is there. So, I've done really well this past year. No upper vents, no upper entrance. Did all those things in the past, many years ago. And uh, you would find a break in brood and, a, and another brood group up there, especially in these really large colonies with lots and lots of nurse bees and everything else, which I don't care about anymore. So anyway, those are things to think about. But if you want it 100% guarantee that you're not going to have eggs in your honey, in your honey super. You have to use a queen excluder. Sorry. Got to put the queen excluder in there. I don't use them because I accept the risk. I'm not a commercial beekeeper. I can inspect and see. 
In fact, when you're looking at your, your flow hives and the honey's just coming out of those tubes and everything, if there were any eggs or larvae coming out, you would see it. And then that whole frame is dead in the water as far as your ability to, can, to take that honey and keep that honey. So you got to feed it back to the bees. And then you don't have a well-established honey bridge. So you didn't, because sometimes, like I said, it might only be two boxes, but it might be three boxes before you can put a honey super on there if you're not going to use a queen excluder. And what do I say? Use a queen excluder. What do I do? I don't use them. I know, clear as mud. But that's what I do. You accept the risk. But if you're venting through the top, and if you have an upper entrance, your likelihood of getting brood up in your honey super is far increased as compared to not having an upper entrance, not having upper venting. Next question. Zelma Bees from Tampa, Florida. As a general rule, do you requeen feral bees? In parentheses, a swarm catch. And if so, do you recommend waiting approximately three days versus introducing the new queen immediately after killing the old one? Okay, I don't. I don't kill. If I'm getting a swarm, especially, can't wait to get some this spring, prime swarms. Uh, no, I don't. get. Why would I get rid of the queen? She's free. She came with a swarm. They're already, by the way, oriented to her, and they're following her pheromone. She, if it's a large swarm, she's in lay. That's a strong queen. If it's a little tiny cluster, you might have an unmated queen there. So it might be an after swarm. But let's say it's a prime swarm. you got a mated queen. She's super fat. You look right at her. You can tell right away that queen's in lay, and she goes right to work laying eggs in the box that you put her in. Why would you get rid of her? Uh, what I'm doing, unless I know for a fact that the swarm came from my bees, but I just put the word out through social media. You might have heard of Facebook. It's a great way to make contact. And by the way, spring is here. Tell everyone, if you've got space for bees, I ran out of space last year, I couldn't take any more bees, but if you have space for bees and you want swarms, put the word out. You go out there and teach people about bees, collect the swarm, and everything is great, but now I don't bring, if that's an unknown origin swarm, so it comes from a nearby town or something, it doesn't come here. Uh, because now I'll have an evaluation apiary where I'm going to park bees of unknown origin. So swarms that I collect, biosecurity, I'm not going to bring them to my backyard apiary, which is about, you know, 80 feet from where I'm sitting right now. Anyway, uh, I will put them in my quarantine apiary, and I'm going to see how healthy they are, what the performance level of the, of the queen is. She's already locally adapted. If it's happening this time of year, she made it through winter. So the bees, the eggs that she's laying and everything, the genetics are going to be locally adapted bees. So the other thing is we want to do that critical mite surveillance. We want to do a mite count. I don't care if you're using alcohol wash or if you're using a sugar shake method. You need to know as they build brood and as they start expanding and you test those nurse bees, see what the mite counts are. You might have a mite resistant line of bees that are already acclimated to your geographic zone. To me, it's a win-win. I would not get rid of that queen on the flip side of that. Now she's terrible. She's overwhelmed with mites, which all doesn't make sense because how would she have survived winter? Now she could come from another bee yard where she was heavily treated and everything else, but that colony that she came out of came through strong enough to generate a nice sized worm and we got the queen that went through winter so she's a tough cookie so that's my thinking put them in a surveillance yard why spend 50 60 bucks for a mated queen if you don't need to if you've already got them local so that's my that's my answer to that i don't get rid of them unless she proves to be bad and then Wait until you place your order for your queen. You made a queen from a great source, hopefully something that is uh, hygienic, varro resistant, things like that. And when you get that queen on order, they usually ship like on a Saturday or something, and you'll have it Monday or Tuesday. So when you get the order confirmation, you know it's going to be coming. Be careful, because this year a lot of breeders are not able to send things out on time. They're way behind. Uh, that's when you would remove the existing queen, get her out of there, and then that way they're queenless for about three days, and then they're more anxious to receive that new queen that you've got coming in. But I would wait to see what kind of performing you have. You, you've got a free colony of bees. You've got a queen. They're all good to go. Why get rid of her ahead of time? This is from St. Germain. Question number five. 
Well, Fred, the hive I mentioned last week with very low brood and no visible queen, I have pretty much confirmed has a laying worker. Laying workers. They're just the worst. Inspection today saw only capped drone brood, and last week you said to maybe just let the hive dwindle away or combine with another active hive. What is your advice with the confirmation of the laying worker? Okay, well, here's the thing. Um, and s some people get upset if I say, if you've got a queenless colony coming into spring and their numbers are small, um, you don't have to combine them with another colony because if your other colonies have made it and they're developing on their own and they're bringing in every indication that they've got brood, you know, if they're bringing in a bunch of pollen and the foragers are heading out, why would you take your bees from a failed colony or a failing colony because you lost the queen and combine them with another colony that's doing okay on its own? I see that as more risk than benefit. And then someone else got upset because they said, just let them die out. Is that mean? Are you being mean to a queenless colony of bees who has already got, keep in mind, a laying worker? If they have a laying worker, sometimes several laying workers, by the way, and it takes a while for that to happen. So they have been queenless for a while. The entire time they're queenless, their numbers are dwindling. This is why queenless colonies get robbed. The queen pheromone is absent. Laying workers put out their own pheromone. Not very strong. Their ovaries are smaller, obviously, than a queen. And uh, they're laying eggs. They're producing only drone. Because they're haploid. They can only lay infertile eggs, which is they get a bunch of males. And even those drones are undersized drones. They're not top performers. So are you being mean to your bees? Are you being cruel in some way to that colony if you just let them die out? No, you didn't kill them. They just lived out their lives and were not replaced. So I don't see that as terrible. Now, if you want to get in there and kill them off, you know, I mean, that's, that's your choice to do. But just letting, letting them end their own natural life cycle, to me, doesn't seem like a terrible thing to do. And uh, I would not pull their leftover resources and put those on other hives either because most backyard beekeepers don't have the ability to determine what the cause of that colony's collapse was. Uh, they came through queenless. Now, let's say you have so many workers in there. Uh, it takes about three weeks for them to be absent the queen's pheromone before the ovaries of some of the workers become active in the absence of the queen pheromone and they start laying their own eggs. So they've been without a queen for at least three weeks. Now you have laying workers. Let's say we have a lot of workers in there, foragers, and we want to use them. We want to see if we can put another queen in there, right? There are some things that you can do, and I'm going to suggest an experiment for those who are experiment-minded and want to play with their bees. If we think in our head, this is a lost colony anyway, why not do some experimenting? Okay, so what's the situation? We may not have many nurse bees left. If they are, they're senior nurse bees because we've got a laying worker, so they've been queenless for at least three weeks. Well, we're past the normal stage that nurse bees would be nurse bees. So we have to have some that are still performing that function, otherwise they wouldn't be able to raise drone brood, right? but the numbers of nurse bees would be much reduced. So keep that in mind too. There'd be fewer of those. These are senior nurse bees that have the ability to fly, for example. So keep that in mind. Normal nurse bees are not great flyers. Normal nurse bees, young bees tending open brood and attending to the queen and things like that, generally don't fly very well and have never been out of the hive yet. So that's not the case. That's not the situation we have. We have laying workers, so all of the bees inside this colony are senior, hardened off, physically capable bees. So let's say that those can fly. This is what I'm going to suggest. Take all, it's because just like queens, uh, the laying worker is a heavy bodied bee. And we've seen bees come in just with nectar and pollen that are almost unable to fly. They're so loaded that they crash to the ground frequently and recover if they can't get in the hive right away. So a gravid bee, a female 
laying worker is too heavy to fly well. So here's what we do. This is just an experiment, something you can try out. You pull every frame out of that hive, because now we're just going to bring in a new queen. So over 500 bees are in there. Let's say that's the kind of thumbnail. That's the minimum 500 workers to have a division of labor, 10 brood, do all the jobs that have to be done inside the hive, and just eek by, just make it. So shake them all out, outside the hive. They have no physical ramp taking them back up to the landing board. Dump them all out right on the ground. Every frame, shake them all out. This is an experiment, remember, do it on a warm day, mid-afternoon, that kind of thing. Foragers, if they're coming and going, we don't care, because who's not foraging? Those laying workers are not foraging. They're just, they're acting like queens, and they're not queens. So they're, they're pretenders, and they need to go. So you shake them all out on the ground, and what's going to happen? The foragers are going to fly back to your colony, and then they're queenless. So even the laying worker pheromone is gone. What can we do to keep them? Because we don't have drones right now. We may be late on getting queens in there. We just want to get rid of the laying workers. So what can we do as a placeholder? If only we could make them believe that there is a queen present in that colony, even when there isn't one, until we can bring in a replacement. Could we do that? Sure could. Guess what this is? This is a temporary queen with QMP for the temporary replacement of a laying queen contains two lures. You have to keep these in the freezer, by the way. And don't handle these lures with your bare hands. You want to handle them with uh, rubber gloves, like nitrile gloves and things like that, because you don't want to smell like a queen bee yourself, because what's going to happen? The bees are going to glom onto you thinking that you're a queen. So you take one of these. There's two lures in here per packet. You can get these. These are hard to find, actually. You can get these from betterbee.com. I bought them. They don't give them to me, obviously. But I'm playing with these this year. So guess what you can do? You put one of these little tubes, right? They come with little zip ties. You put it right on the frame, right in the middle of what would be the brood area. Now there's a queen pheromone there that makes the bees think, hey, there's a queen. And so that has an impact on the metabolism of the bees that are there. They think that there's a queen. They think they're queen right. The only thing that's missing would be new eggs and developing larvae after uh, three days that eggs would be laid. So once this is in there as a placeholder, that keeps other workers from being stimulated to develop their ovaries and become laying workers as well. So it's a placeholder. And in the meantime, you get on the phone and you call in, you know, the mated queen that you want. You talk to a friend or you get your really strong colonies that have... Um, Queen cells in them that are happening this time of year, but that is not going to work unless you have drones flying around. So if we don't have the genetic stock to mate a virgin queen, we have to use this placeholder. So all the instructions will come with this, and uh, you have two of the lures you put in one at a time, by the way. And then after a week or two, you're going to replace it to keep that queen pheromone present. So we're lying to the bees. We're messing with them. But guess what's happening all that time? Their numbers are losing or they're, they're dropping in numbers through normal attrition. So their lives are coming to an end and spring is kicking in. But guess what having that pheromone lure will stimulate them to do? They'll be bringing in pollen. They'll be bringing in nectar and resources. They'll invest in infrastructure because... Even though they don't understand why there's no new eggs in there, the queen's pheromone tells them that we have a queen right colony, so they go back to work. That's my experiment. Try that. Shake all your bees out. Let the foragers come back. Put a fake queen pheromone lure in there. Well, it's a real pheromone lure, but fake queen. And then see how that goes and get back to me. I have other things I want to do with that, by the way. I'll cue you in. All right. So clue you in, not cue you in. But anyway, when you get these little after swarms that are like the size of, you know, your fist or whatever, they've got a queen with them, but she's not mated. So she may not be what you want. You can see if you can actually use one of these queen pheromone lures to attract 
bees from a swarm right onto your hand or into your box. More practical it would be if you could get them to go right into the box, use that queen pheromone lure. So when bees are swarming, looking all over for the queen, maybe we can get them to go into a box and now we can put a real queen in there several days after they've occupied that box and fly that in. So you pick the genetics that you want. There are a lot of different things you can do, but the best thing that it can prevent is laying workers from starting doing what they do because they only do that in the absence of a queen pheromone. So let's go on to the next question, number six, John Kelly. Let's see, one item that still perplexes me is how the boxes merely loosely stack on each other and being unconnected, lacking rigid support. We have wind in the northern plains. Your use of ballast on the hive roofs, your measuring of hive slope, and your taking off stations made perfect sense. Thanks again. Okay. It is a puzzle because when we look at these beehives, I understand that. We've got these boxes. There's no screws holding them together. Although when it comes to my swarm capture boxes, they have clamps. But yeah, you get your first bottom board here and you're putting your stuff together. You've got all your frames. You set that on there. You line everything up all careful. Do, 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 do. What on earth keeps it there? Then you put your inner cover on, put your outer cover on. And this is where, this is a tie-in, so we're going to get some information out of this. Why do we have an inner cover and an outer cover? Now those migratory covers, by the way, which I don't use, but commercial beekeepers do because they need an economy of equipment. But this is a normal beginning configuration. This outer cover, we pull off really easy. Why is that? because nothing glues it down. Oh, what kind of glue? Now we get to the inner cover and you have to pry that thing off because there's a sticky substance between this and this inner cover and it's called propolis. Propolis for the population. So it's resin from trees and things like that that the bees bring in and it's really sticky and they bring it on their hind legs just the way some bees bring in pollen and those that are bringing in the propolis or propolis, you hear it said both ways, they can't even get that off their legs themselves. Other bees have to help them, super sticky and they no longer collect pollen or anything else. They are only propolis collectors. Once they bring that in, on a nice hot day, they start using it to seal up all the little grooves and cracks and it even, by the way, testament to how well it seeps into the joints, it actually goes into this joint a little ways, but it becomes so sticky. An uh, interesting side note, there's a famous violin called the Stradivarius. Propolis was used as part of the finish for the Stradivarius violins. Isn't that interesting? But anyway, that's also what glues this box to the landing board, uh, which is also the bottom board. If you have a slatted rack in here, they'll glue that up together too. And it's any place where they find a crevice or a joint or any place where bacteria can build up. They put an antibacterial material in there known as propolis. So you want a bunch of it in there and that's how it all glues together. So a brand new colony that you just put together without bees in it, you're right. Nothing's holding this all together. You just put weights on it, shipping straps, things like that to keep it together. We have all these high winds here. We have 50, 60 mile an hour winds and my hives have straps and weights on them. Because let's be honest, under extreme weather circumstances, you do need other things to keep your hive equipment held together. So the propolis and stuff, once it seals up, once it's dry, even when cold weather hits, that stuff is good to go. In fact, it's pretty darn difficult to pull your boxes apart. That's why we need hive tools to do it. And that's also why we work our hives on hot days because it's much easier then to work with that because it softens up again when it's warm outside. So that's a great beginner question and something I'm sure a lot of people probably wondered about. And uh, that's it. Propolis, propolis. Propolis envelope, the more of it the better because the collective immunity of that colony, the energy they put into that goes down, 
when the hive interior itself becomes antibacterial, and that's through a propolis envelope. Marlis Bivak, look into her research on that. Next question, number seven, Kathy W. Thank you for addressing my question in the last video for making a swarm of bees to stay, especially for the smaller swarm. I steal a frame of brood from a large hive to put in with a few drawn frames and honey. Just to give them something to do, it seems to work well, but I'm not sure if there is a downside from doing this. I have two hives that are coming out of winter really weak. They're not completely dead, but they have very few bees coming out and going back in with pollen. I watched the weakest one for about five minutes and saw just three bees back with the pollen and the two guard bees walked around. I know they are not robbing bees, but I'm not sure to open the hive and check is a good idea when it is not really warm, 62 degrees Fahrenheit. How small is a hive that there would be no hope to recover even in these days when they're getting warmer and would you give up on them? What is your criteria to make the call? And they have plenty of resources inside. If they should be helped, what should I do? I have strong hives, but not sure. Transferred sealed brood, nursing bees would be a good idea. Thanks for sharing. Okay. This goes back to what I talked about at the very beginning where they had laying workers. If they have at least 500 bees, um, they can keep each other warm. They can do things. Sometimes pulling frames of brood, if you're going to do that from another colony, you are taking away from that colony's strength. So right now, if I looked at, I have one tiny colony that I'm making a video about that I'm going to show to you later because they looked like they were done and they're bouncing back and they're doing weird things. So anyway, sidetrack. Small colonies, I leave to themselves to either make it or not. And I will help them, sure. They made it through winter, it's springtime. If they're bringing in pollen and it looks like there's a queen in there, I want to see them build up because we don't know what caused their losses. I would not weaken at this time of year any other colonies that I have in my aviary in order to strengthen a colony that's tiny and not making it on their own coming out of winter. And the reason for that is one thing is we're going to be putting a strain on that colony and they may not have what it takes. Uh, to take care of a bunch of brood. So if you stick brood frames in, you're gonna to have to bring uh, nurse bees with them. So the bees that are on those frames, when you transfer them and put them into that hive that's weak, um, you need to bring that force because they're already too tiny. They can't handle full frames of brood. Keep it all warm, 94 to 97 degrees Fahrenheit on the brood and do all the other tasks. If you notice that when you look at these early spring colonies on a really warm day when you can open it up and look at them, uh, you'll see that their clusters are really tiny, and that's because they can afford resource-wise and bee number-wise to keep that tiny cluster warm, and then at the same time, bee foraging, bee cleaning. One of the last things you see colonies do in spring is pulling out their dead bees because first things first, they need food and resources for the living. And so they also need warmth to maintain the brood. So even capped brood, even though it doesn't require that you feed them, there is a huge amount of resource consumption that's involved when they have to generate the heat necessary to maintain that warmth. Look what's going on in my neck of the woods today. Uh, we're in the 30s again. So I made that call yesterday because it was a nice hot day. And uh, I'm looking at a really tiny colony of bees but they're also very active. And I was thinking, ah, I want to know what they're doing. Maybe I should open it up and maybe I should put a medium box on there right now. But I don't really want to do that because what's their instinct going to be if we expand them? They're going to move, some of the bees will move away from the brood and they'll try to go up near the heat of an insulated cover. And then that thins out the number of bees that are down here to tend the brood. So they can actually lose some of their brood. They can be chilled and all these other things. So I leave them closed up this time of year because warm weather is not here to stay yet. I also don't want to take away from a really strong colony because these are my choices later. Instead of nursing an undersized colony that may not make it anyway, that's the other end of it. We don't want to transfer honey and resources in there because now we are 
exchanging whatever pathogens might exist, although we're going from a strong colony to a weak colony, the greater concern would be going from the weaker colony and combining it with a stronger colony, which also I would not do this spring, this time of year. Because if I leave the stronger colonies alone, I can make splits with those and come out with two very strong colonies and have the genetics of the strong colony that made it through winter, not the weaker genetics of the colony that is struggling this time of year. So sure, you can put food and resources on there. So if you've got pollen patties or if you want to put sugar syrup on there or something like that now that it's warm enough for them to do cleansing flights and everything because they'll make use of the sugar syrup when it's over 50 degrees. So those things could help them out. And you just, they might surprise you. They might bounce back. But you know what concerns me is watching them for five minutes and seeing three bees with pollen. Because keep in mind, that doesn't mean there's a queen in there. What that does mean is they have to feed some brood. So what other brood might they be feeding? They might be feeding drone brood. So you might have a laying worker. So things already might be working against that colony and they may not be ready to bounce back. So I recommend keeping them separate, focusing on the really strong colonies and using them later to make splits and then you get strong. And we're working with survivor genetics, right? For your area, in your apiary, the history of the bees that you know. So my preference would be to favor the stronger colonies, support the weaker colonies, but not combine or exchange resources between them because we're also exchanging potential pathogens and things like that, B to B. So that's my, it's what I would do. Now, of course, you know, you can do anything you want. These are just my opinions and stuff and give me food for thought so that you can think about what you might do. Question number eight comes from Gary. How did the broodminder function over winter for you? Did it help in monitoring the colony health and help give any pre-warming of potential problems? Pre-warning of potential problems. Well, I don't know because I don't have a broodminder. I don't have any broodminders in any of my hives. The only thing I did this year was I put uh, humidity and temperature sensors all the way in the top in the feeder shim. So nothing inside the hive at all. I don't have a broodminder, don't own one. I do have friends that have them and use them and find the data to be widely variable. Uh, I'm glad I did not spend the money on a broodminder yet. They came out with a new one that also weighs your bees and they have sensors and they communicate to your phone and everything else. I don't personally have them, so that's a funny question for me, but I will take the opportunity just to say that those that have shared with me about them are not finding consistent data, good, accurate data. Hive weights, temperatures, humidity, everything like that. So you have to weigh the value of the tool and whether or not it's meaningful to you. I do like the idea of putting sensors, heat and humidity in the top feeder shim, which is where the rabbit rounds are in wintertime. And all that does, this is why, you know, for me, the data doesn't have to be accurate. If it's 38 degrees out there and it's nighttime and up in the feeder shim, it's 43 degrees. What's it tell me? I have a live hive. That's all I want to know. I also want to know if they're all of a sudden getting blasted with humidity. So if the humidity up there in the feeder shim, keep in mind, the wrap-it around feeder up there. So I was putting them inside the wrap-it rounds. So these things have dry sugar in them. Obviously it wouldn't work if you had syrup in there, but I put the sensors in here on the dry sugar and the center cone is off. So you only have this cover. So now what I do is I get a really good read on the humidity rising through the center column and occupying the space up here. So I get temperature and humidity. That's all I need. The most basic information because it tells me, oh look, they're alive. And this was interesting too. The largest colony had real spikes in humidity different times of the day. It was really interesting. So that's what I do. They're super cheap, by the way. The sensors, I did a video showing the sensors. I'll put a link to that down in the video description. Humidity and uh, temp sensors. I have nine of them. So nine colonies got monitored. 
but yeah, I don't, uh, I don't have a hive brood minder at all. So if you have them and you want to share, you know, do they work? Do they not? Please write in the comment section below this video and share what benefit you've gained from having brood minder sensors, scales. What do you think their accuracy has been? How have you used that as a tool? And do you recommend spending the money to get them? Right now, I don't have them. I've never tested it. And I can't have a valid personal opinion about it. The next question, number nine here. Doug Brown from Powell River, British Columbia. How do you deal with a very small colony if you also have large ones? Okay. And that seems an odd question right off the bat. If you have a small colony and you have large ones. Well, we'll go back to the previous question there that uh, I don't rob strong colonies to strengthen weak colonies. One of the things that I did, because the weird colony that I'm making my video that will probably come out tomorrow, I'm going to put that up because I got all the video sequences already. I was doing landing board inspections. Yesterday I was walking around and uh, looking to see what the pollen rate is and everything else. And then I looked at one of the hives and it looked like it was being robbed. What's What's, when you're looking at a colony from a distance, what tells you that it might be getting robbed? Well, a lot of kind of hovering bees outside the colony. And uh, they're also not trying to get in generally the main entrance, although they could do that if they're strong enough. If it's a weak colony, they're kind of trying to come in from the sides, looking for other openings, back doors, upper entrances, things like that, that they think might not be well defended because the robbing bees don't want to encounter guard bees. They don't want to have to fight. They just want to get in there, steal their stuff and get out. And if they can get in and out often enough, pretty soon they actually start smelling like that colony. And then they get a pass and they can slow, low key rob out a colony instead of an all out attack. Uh, bees that smell like that colony get in and out and uh, go back home. And you think, well, if they smell like that colony and they go back home to their resident colony that they came from, don't they get rejected because now they smell like another colony? No, they get accepted. Why? Because they're full of resources. Stranger comes to your house for bringing gifts. They have all the stuff to fill your freezer and your fridge and everything else. They're going to be welcome. So that's how they get back home. But anyway, I'm looking at this one colony and it has all that going on. And then I see that they're actually uh, bringing in pollen and things that uh, bees don't do when they're robbing. I also have guards at the entrance, and then I thought, that's really strange. And you know what they're doing? They're actually chewing the insulated hive cover, the polystyrene. So I got the video camera really close, so you can hear that too. And the reason I'm telling you all this is this is how I decided what to do with them. They're a small colony. I wrote them off because it was the very last swarm I collected in 2020, very late in the year. I just happened to have a box handy. I threw them in there. There's no feeder shim on there. There's just a standard inner cover. It's a deep 10 frame box with a slatted rack underneath the solid bottom and it's all clipped together. So it's actually still my swarm collecting box. Last one of the year. So then I just parked it there. Here they are, they're alive. Now I don't want them to get robbed out right now, which is a high possibility because there's lots of pollen in the environment. There's some nectar. Uh, but it's also for the really strong colonies. Strong colonies rob weak colonies. It's what they do. So now what I put in there is because I have to test out, testing out the hive gate, H-Y-F-E-G-A-T-E. -E. So I pulled the entrance reducer on this small weak colony and I put in this hive gate, which by the way, goes right through the entrance. And this is the part that sticks out the front. And what that does is creates this long corridor that now the bees coming and going have to go all the way through this and they come up under the cluster of the bees. Where if it's a smaller colony, uh, the cluster is going to be defended by their guard bees. So you can't send guards all over the place. Although this particular hive was unusually alert. Uh, just me being there for a while, they built up their numbers. In other words, there were like five or six bees on the outside standing guard. But the longer I sat there with a video camera and the longer I observed them, the more bees massed on the outside watching me. So they're actually pretty darn prepared as far as their defenses go, but they're a single deep coming into spring. So I put this in there and what's that going to do? Any guard bee that lands, any scout that lands on the landing board is going to have to go into this end piece, 
going to have to walk through this full length before they get inside. And what are they going to meet right here in this entrance? Guard bees. And they're not going to like it. And these bees are pretty darn... I wouldn't call them defensive to the point where they would attack me just because I'm there, because none of them did. But uh, I swapped out their entrance reducer and everything else and put this in. And now, so what would I do for the small colony? Make sure they have only one entrance. Make sure they have no upper vents. Make sure that the only entrance they have, because this is part of my own citizen science project right now, that this one will have a hive gate in there. And then I'm going to see now, look at this little area. By the way, mice can't get in. Nothing gets in through this. They also come with these metal plates for your entrance if you want to do that. And then later when the colony gets bigger, you use two of these in here so you get the picture. I have a web page for it that I've set up because people that have bought these that are going to find out if they can help their small colonies. This is what they're designed for. Helping small colonies defend themselves against wasp attacks, which happens late in the year, but this time of year, attacks from other honeybee colonies. So I put that on there. By the way, I completely flustered the bees that occupied it. That colony, it took them a good hour before they were able to figure out that that's their entrance. And then pollen-loaded little bees started scooting right in there. So they're chewing their top. They've cut a hole in the polystyrene. This is an example of where all the colonies in my apiary are acting the same. And then the one, because they all have the exact same hive top configuration. They have an, in, you know, they have an inner cover and some of them have feeder shims, but they all have this insulated cover on there and they're chewing it. So someone said that, uh, someone said, I read that sometimes the bees uh, get up against a polystyrene surface and feel like it is like pulpy wood and they're trying to chew it and shape it and seal it up. So I might also find that propolized. So the judgment call I made, knowing that the storm's coming today, was not to open that colony. But instead I videoed it, showed all the conditions, showed my observations, explained my logic, and then uh, put the hive gate in there. So... I'm going to see how that goes, but when the warm weather finally comes for good, we have days coming in the 70s, but of course rain and stuff comes with it. I'm going to open that one up. I want to see what's going on in there because they're an interesting behaving bunch of bees. Queen for sure because the pollen, the rate that the pollen is coming in is just ridiculous. But so what I do is uh, make sure that the smaller colonies are well protected. They have defenses. This is the first year I have these hive gate channels. Something that I've always thought would work, a long, narrow corridor. Um, and now we get to practical test it, see how that comes out. Easier for them to defend. They can vent through that. They haul the dead bees out through it and everything else. We're going to wait to see how that goes. That's all I do. And I'm not feeding them. That's the other thing. They have no feeder shim on there. Like I said, I wrote them off. I decided to let them, you know, get what they could while they could and go into winter and they made it without any intervention. The only thing he did was I sprinkled some dry sugar on top of the inner cover, and uh, they did not eat all of that, as far as I can tell. Of course, they may be in fifth gear right now and doing that, but inspections will tell the tale. But that's what I do, small entrances. Hive gate, if you have one. Uh, question number 10, Jim Buns, Dunville, Ontario, Canada. Lots of Canadian people watching, thank you by the way, and in the UK and everywhere else. Just great having everybody here. I built a Long Lang last summer. Again, this is the Long Langstroth hive. Put in a nuke. A nuke is a nucleus colony that comes with frames with brood and eggs and everything all in it. Queen, workers, nurse bees, everything together. Fastest way to expand. It expanded beautifully. Was well, doing great until two ago, I'm going to guess two weeks ago, all dead very small patch of brood left with 60 pounds of honey next frame over. I used all acorn plastic frames without communication holes other than bee space to the sides and bottom. Do you feel they starve from the inability to break cluster to move to their resources? Scott Hendricks in Northern Ontario drills communication holes in the center of his frames. What are your thoughts, please? Well, I've actually talked with the owner of Acorn Frames. Those are my favorite one-piece plastic frames. And we talked about having a punch-out right in the middle there. 
And he said uh, all those tests have failed because in the bees just put comb in those holes and it's usually drone comb. So, but the other thing is, as I explained earlier with my horizontal hive, I used only foundationless or better comb so that the bees could make those communication holes and transfer through the frames, through the comb, where otherwise they couldn't with the plastic frames and none of the punch outs are here. Uh, there are acorn frames. These are the heavy waxed plastic frames. If you're buying plastic frames, I recommend Acorn over Pierco, over Man Lake, over all the other manufacturers right now because they get used first by the bees and drawn out the fastest. So, it is obviously, this is the situation that I had in my hive. So, with or without plastic frames, they got stuck on so many frames and stayed there ignoring the other resources in the colony. So this is a repeat of exactly what happened here. So I don't think they start from an inability to break cluster or to move to their resources. Gets anybody's guess, because we don't understand why bees don't do that other than that they start building brood. So there's information that may not be here. I don't know if Jim fed pollen patties. I don't know. I did not. I did not do supplemental feeding for that horizontal hive. So I did not kick off an artificial brood boom, you know, too early and things like that. So the, everything they did, they did on their own. Mine were the Saskatrass bees. I don't know what uh, kinds of bees are being used here in uh, Northern Ontario. So the horizontal hive issue is just going to continue. And again, for those of you who have horizontal hives in Northern areas where it gets really cold, did you have similar experience? Did they migrate through everything? Are they coming out of spring booming? I just don't have enough of them for a consensus there. I can't give statistics on, you know, why they made it or not. All my entrance at a single entrance facing southeast, thick material insulated the cover, uh, did not leave any feed on. They didn't, supposedly didn't need it because they still have plenty of honey. Very annoying. Annoying and frustrating. So... All I can say is if you're going to use the acorn plastic frames in a horizontal hive format, you can get those foundations where you snap off the corners. It doesn't matter if you snap off the corners high or low. Although it does seem to be that they like to maintain a travel corridor in the lower parts of their frames over the upper part. So if you're going to snap off the corners and create those entrances, you're going to drill a hole. I would drill the holes in the lower corners over the upper corners. They seem to like to make those holes themselves, so why not follow suit with what the bees do when left on their own? And I don't have any other information than that. But if you guys are doing horizontal hives, because in the southern areas, you know, things are different. They can move. They have more days when it's above 50 degrees where the cluster breaks and they move around and they get to their new resources. So up here, where we didn't get any of those days this winter, it stayed cold. We got like one day. So we had continuous week after week after week after week of frozen weather. So the bees didn't get to loosen up their clusters. They didn't get to migrate around inside their hives the way they otherwise would. And they did not get to access their resources. Very frustrating and disappointing because I was looking forward to such a great spring with them. Next, question number 11, Alan Patton. Ala, Louisiana. Louisiana, Louisiana, however you say it. I'm disabled and saw how you built your long lang and I love it. I think I can work with something like that. So I'm building a long lang straw beehive and was wondering why the half inch opening is cut out about three quarters up from the bottom of the inside floor instead of even with the floor. In one of your most recent videos, you showed using two little wooden sticks do, 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 to clean out the dead bees from the entrance opening. These are them. These are standard Weber kebab bamboo sticks. I stick them in there. Pull out the dead bees. And this is why, this is why I had that thought. That opening on the Long Langstroth Hive is off the bottom. And that's because the way the frames are oriented to the entrance. So we have all the frames here. And that Long Lang, the entrance comes perpendicular to them up off the bottom. I 
wanted them to be able to not be stuck when a bunch of bees die inside the hive. So by having an elevated entrance, slightly off the bottom, when the bees die and they pile up on the bottom, they wouldn't plug the entrance. And I thought that was cool. I thought that was a great idea. My next one, the entrance will probably be closer to the bottom because I can't just scrape out the bees. I have to actually now pull the frames to get to any dead bees on the bottom. But the plus side of that is, and why I did it, it's so that when the bees pile up on the bottom of your hive, they're dead there and they're waiting for those undertaker bees to haul them out on a nice day. Uh, they don't block the entrance. Many beekeepers, myself included, have had colonies die because we did not keep up with dead bees on that entrance. So nowadays, over the past several years, I make it my daily thing to get out there with little scrapers and I make sure that those entrances are clear of dead bees. Sometimes you, know, you get that feeling like, wow, this, there's dead bees in the snow in front of that one. There's dead bees in the snow in front of that one. There's no dead bees in front of the snow in that one. And it's a day where the sun shines and gets warm. They're doing cleansing flights. This colony is not doing cleansing flight. Are they dead? But then you go and you scoop out a bunch of dead bees. And just like a bunch of bees were waiting in line to get out, they all go flying out and they start doing cleansing flights. So that's why I elevated my entrance. I didn't want that to happen. I don't want bees to die. My observation hives, they plugged the hole with dead bees. I had a bunch of live bees in there. Couldn't get out. Couldn't do cleansing flights because the entrance is so concealed and so deep. I sent my scope in there to look at and I saw a bunch of dead bees in there. As soon as you pull it out, the live bees came to life, zipping in and out. You can kill your colony if you don't clear those bees. So anyway, another thing you might consider doing is having a separate winter entrance if you can't keep up with the bees, if you're not going to be there. So you would have an entrance up off the bottom, and uh, that way dead bees wouldn't plug the entrance, and your bees can come and go when they get a chance for cleansing flights. And then, of course, you make sure that opening is small enough so that the bees... Uh, do not have to deal with rodents getting in like mice. And I found that a 3 8 inch opening, which by the way, these things, although you know, I didn't have it for winter time, but these things would not allow the entrance of a mouse. So if these were elevated in a little opening up off the bottom, dead bees would pile up on the bottom, but also they can pull the dead bees out through these and get rid of them easily. And... Uh, it also controls venting. One of the things we have going on right now, because I've talked with the inventor of these hive gates, by the way, they have glass bottom uh, beehives so they can see what goes on in there. And when they have big storms and the wind goes whipping by, like we have going on right now, um, the bees inside the hive were being buffeted all around by the eddy currents that were established when the wind comes raking across the entrance or jamming into the entrance, the bees that had these long channel entrances on them were not being knocked around by these strong winds. So it was another thing that was interesting because we get these strong wind storms when it's 18, 19 degrees outside. That's kind of a big deal for your bees to contend with too, but it just makes the cluster get tighter and tighter and tighter. But uh, so anyway, that's why I did that. And this is interesting because now see, Alan is in Louisiana. So that's a place, I see the horizontal hive in a place where the bees can move around and use the resources. It's gonna be a great thing. It's gonna work because they didn't die for lack of saving up food and stuff. They died because they wouldn't move to it. Couldn't move to it. I don't know, you know, what the decision making process is, but I was just ready to have bragging rights and have the strongest colony ever and see them continue to build out. You know, they did over 20 frames of comb, but there was better comb in there too that they didn't have to draw out. So they were able to store a lot of resources late in the year in a very short amount of time. Darn it. Elevated entrance. Place for dead bees to go. But it also makes it harder for your workers to get the dead bees out. And dead bees, pew, they smell like a dead animal. 
So you would think they'd want to get them out right away. I've got another hive that's just cleaning house like crazy right now. Anyway, next question, number 12, Dave Sheeran. I have four hives in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. That's Amish territory. All came through winter with good populations. Two of them are packed with 20 frames of bees. Seeing capped drone brood, I was considering making splits. But I'm worried that March, beginning of April, is too early for mating flight success. Appreciate any thoughts on this. It is too early. And we do, but it's good news that they're making the capped drone brood. And I'm also glad these stories of the people that have had really good results getting their bees through winter, those are good stories because a lot of people have had a devastating year. Anyway, uh, the drone brood, the minute they hatch out, they're not ready to mate. So they're not flying. This is where you want to get your fellowship of beekeepers in your area talking because do you see drones do you have drones are you drones flying so once the drones are flying and taken to the air and everything else uh, that's when you have an opportunity with these strong colonies right now i do consider it to be too cold so we want lots of flying days uh, we'll see what the bees are doing themselves so we also there are other things we have to do we have to expand our hive bodies as the weather warms up you do that too soon you got problems so we want to keep them um, heated in that upper area we don't want to disrupt them and so it's not a good time to, to do splits it's too early now lancaster county i'm sure they're warmer than i am but when you see meaningful drone flights lots of them on the landing boards two things are happening one we have genetics in the air from other colonies feral and everything else in the area those are all good things because we want our queens to have someone to mate with the other thing is we know that those uh, colonies are strong because they don't even make drones unless the resources are good, unless the colony has the numbers and the nurse bees feel like they can handle the surplus. Otherwise, they wouldn't let the queen lay those eggs and they wouldn't take care of them. So, we're too early. Wait till they're flying. Check in with others. See what kind of drones are in the area. You also see there's, there's no bigger group of hobos than drones because you see drones that don't belong in your colony that just show up they're just a bunch of freeloaders but the good news is that means they're coming from somewhere else lots of drones in the area time to make splits if your colony's strong so that sounds good everything sounds good there but i would wait question this is from dry cut homestead dry cut dry cut uh will a queen lay workers that vary in appearance like multiple variations of color or is this most likely due to be drift maybe there are other possible reasons why i might have bees that vary in appearance this are thoughts from william well here's the thing yeah you have sister bees in your colony right so let's go back how did they get there in the first place well we have this queen that when she hatched she zipped around, she got in shape, and you made herself super strong, flapped her wings and everything, did a little piping and talking to everybody, ran around, hugged all the other bees and started spreading her pheromone around. But she's not mated yet. So about nine days after a queen hatches, she's capable of flying out to mate. So then when she does that, she flies out. So now all these bees in the future in that colony are gonna be from that queen, but they don't all have the same dad right so the queen flies out and she finds a congregation area and uh you know the fastest moving strongest most robust muscled out males are going to beat out all the other hundreds or even thousands of males in the drone congregation area they're going to catch up to the queen they're going to smell her pheromone while she's on the wing if it's too similar to their own if that pheromone is genetically tied to them they're not going to be so interested in mating with that queen especially they came from the same colony so the strange bees, the ones that determine that she's out of her neighborhood, that she's not from their genetics, they're the ones that zip in there and then they mate with her and then they die. And then after that one mates with her, another one mates with her and then and then he dies too. And so they're just dying all over the place. And the queen is just flying around there and she's getting mated and she returns to the hive after mating with, who knows, 10 up to 20 different males went way past what she needed to do so apparently she just wanted to overkill it so now potentially anyway let's say conservatively 15 males had congress with the queen 
And uh, they're all dead and uh, laying in fields and they fulfill their purpose in life. And she comes back with a mating sign on her, which would be the reproductive organ of the last male to mate with her. And then so the queen retinue kicks in like, oh, you got something on you. And they remove that. And then they start taking care of her. And lo and behold, she's mated. And in her spermatheca, she has a bunch of sperm from all of these males. And now she starts to produce eggs. And as they pass the spermatheca, travels down a little tube and she produces fertile eggs, female workers. Those are the diploid eggs, and then we have haploid, which would be the males. If she decides not to release sperm, that egg goes out, it becomes a drone. So anyway, now we have all these workers. So the workers from the same male are full sisters. They all look alike. And uh, then we have half-sisters. So those have the same mother, different male. They don't look like these other sisters from the other male. So depending on how many different bees, because we're dealing with Apis mellifera, so all of Apis mellifera uh, can breed with other stock, other lines of the same species of bee. So some of them could be golden colored. Some of them, maybe she hung out with some Russians and they're all black now, so their abdomens are all black. They could potentially all be in the same beehive, the same colony together. And what's interesting about that is these half-sisters don't look out for each other as well as the full sisters. So it's very interesting that those that are from the same drone and queen, they're all from that same queen, but a bunch of them are from different drones. So it's interesting that they actually congregate and can work with one another when they've come from the same drone. So that's an area of study where how do they know that they're genetically connected and they're 100%? So we have half siblings and we have full siblings. But that's why some of them look different because the drones that they made it with. I did a movie called, well, movie, music video thing of uh, drones flying called Drones, Drones, Drones. And on one landing board of one hive, the drones were all different colors. There were golden, rusty colored drones and there were dark drones and everything else. So one thing we know for sure, in that colony, one thing is going to all look the same if they've come from that queen. Because you mentioned bee drift here, which is a possibility also, but drones. As I mentioned before, they're like hobos that show up at everybody's doorstep and they ask for resources and uh, they just get invited in. I don't even know why. But all the drones from that queen should all look exactly the same. Because it's only her genetics that are making up that drone. So anyway... Uh, you see a bunch of different drones in that short clip if you want to see it. There'll be a link down in the video description. Drone video. But yep, yeah, the females can all look very different. That's because there's so many different baby daddies in there. Mm -hmm. So the next one is from Paul Van Leer. Let's see. Open my two colonies this week and both are Eight frames with two deeps. The upper deep of both hives had four frames of brood. The lower box only has drawn comb. Would you recommend reversing the boxes or let the bees decide what to do? At a third 10 frame until February when we had that severe cold here in PA. I believe it happened due to too much area too warm. And I had uh, too much area to warm and I had left a drawn third medium on. I think I learned my lesson. Won't make that mistake next year. Thank you for all the help you've given. Okay. This is a question that comes around a lot. I'm not a box swapper, so I don't swap. You know, you hear about people taking the bottom brood boxes and swapping them around, and that's to get the bees to use the space the way it's being described here. So where are they right now? They're in the upper part of the box. Right now I've got that one wildcat colony that's actually eating their box. They're chewing their cover. So what is going on is that they're staying up high in the box away from the entrance this time of year. Why? Because it's cold outside. It's in the 30s right now. Why would they want to move their brood down near the entrance where all that cold air is blasting in there? And uh, now they have to work that much harder to keep the brood warm. So my recommendation is... That bottom box, even though it's empty and has a bunch of frames or whatever, leave everything intact. Don't move anything yet. 
this is the spring buildup. So I like to leave them the way they are until they start to increase their numbers and they will eventually backfill that space warmer days. They'll migrate down naturally and then their storage will be honey and resources up in the top. But right now, if you swap them out and you move those upper frames down to that lower box, you just put all of that brood, which requires warming from the bees and they have to use all their resources to keep it at that temperature. Um, now we've got cold air right at that entrance. Great airflow bad for this time of year because we get very cold nights very cold days leave them the way they are hopefully you've got an insulated cover and they will stay up there and as the season progresses as the days warm they will naturally start to move down on their own but if you move them down yourself because you're anxious you want to reconfigure things or whatever you're just getting them close closer to that really cold entrance so i recommend leaving them the way they are that was the last question of the day. Thank you everyone for being here. This is the fluff section. For those of you who want to stick around, I'm not answering questions. I'm just shooting the breeze, talking about stuff. Layen's hive is getting ready to go out in the bee yard and I have a new stand to put it on. So I already put it out there. My uh, five-year-old grandson helped me out with that. Adjustable legs, super heavy duty, holds like 900 pounds or something like that. The Lance Hive is insulated. I did a Bob Ross style painting with a two inch brush and just a bunch of house paint. Just made a mess of it. But anyway, it will help the bees identify that. So that's going out in the coming week. I didn't want to put it out just before these big storms. What's the point? But I have to get it out and set and make sure that all the paint is drying for as long as possible before it gets occupied by the bees. I used an exterior latex semi-gloss paint. And uh, the first big swarm that I can find, I put the word out to, is going in that Layens hive. And it's out in a field by itself. So that's the good news too. Bad news is now I have to move my uh, feeding station. So the other thing is, uh, I caution people about the pollen substitute. I used Ultra Bee Dry Pollen Sub and I put out a sweet super slow motion video of the bees taking that to kick off the early stuff. They use that stuff for about seven days and now they ignore it completely because the environment has already kicked in. So the lesson learned is don't buy a 50 pound bag of Ultra Bee Sub if you're a backyard beekeeper. We don't need it. So the bees, uh, I only bought the 10 pound tub, which is pretty darn expensive by the way, but if it gave them a tiny boost, that was worth it. So they were getting pollen from skunk, cabbage, all the maple trees are really kicking in right now. You can see it in the treetops. You can hear the bees buzzing. So they're all bringing in pollen and uh, they're doing great. They're getting nectar on their own as well. So even if you put out, uh, which I wouldn't recommend this time of year because it's unnecessary, but if you want to feed your bees, like you want to get some nectar going inside, one of the things I'm testing this year is of course, we talked about this, Hive Alive. Somebody just wrote me about this and said, hey, Hive Alive's been proven. Have you mentioned that before? Yes, I have. I'm By the way, a big thing like this is very expensive. And uh, 2.5 milliliters per liter. So what you want to do is if you're worried about nosema, things like that, kicking your bees off. The science is pretty solid on that. So for these early, one of the things I should have mentioned are probably on a weak colony. Once we get to the point where we can put sugar syrup up in your feeder shims, if you've got these lagging colonies or these early startup colonies, Hive Alive has a very good uh, track record, good underpinnings of science there. So yeah, didn't even use my 10 pound tub of pollen sub. So didn't even get through it. They're not touching it now. Watch for drones, as we mentioned before. Don't do any splitting or anything like that until you know for sure that you've got drones in the air and that they can breed your stuff. Uh, stage your hive equipment. So catches people off guard every single year. All of a sudden there's a swarm of bees and you're running around looking for everything. So what you want to kind of set up is a rapid deployment station. So uh, if you're catching them with butterfly nets, which is what I use to collect swarms, you have to have boxes ready to transport them. My transport tubs this year are going to be the Hive Butlers. So I'm using those. And uh, just have everything ready. In fact, that Hive Butler tote is a good thing to put all your stuff inside of it. So if you've got sugar spray, sugar syrup, stuff like that. Now, that comes up too. 
if I make my sugar syrup right now one to one, and that's what I use to spritz the swarms when they're hanging on a tree branch or something to make them heavier so they drop into the tub, won't that sugar syrup spoil? No, not if you put honeybee healthy in it. So a teaspoon or more, but a teaspoon is the minimum per quart of honeybee healthy essential oils. You mix it in with the sugar syrup and that stuff will not spoil. So it's good for all summer. So that's your emergency deployment kit. And then your gloves, your veil, whatever you want for that transport. We all know that uh, swarms are very easy to handle. So that just a veil generally is enough, long sleeve shirt, things like that. Have boots maybe that you can pull on so you don't get the bees crawling up your pant legs. I don't know how some people do it. They're out there with their baggy shorts and their baggy pants. And uh, next thing you know, they've been inside the house for half an hour and something's crawling inside your pants up on the back of your knee. Cover yourself just in case. So again, that upcoming video is coming out uh, with the, uh, the colony that's chewing their interior cover. So we're going to look at that. And that's pretty much it for me. So if you want to remember that you've seen this video, don't forget to click the like button down there. I invite you to subscribe. Join the fellowship, the Way to Be Fellowship on Facebook. If you have Facebook and you want to talk to people about bees, share your stuff, share your results, ask questions anytime, day or night. I'm really glad that you were here today. Thanks for watching and participating by sending in your questions. I hope you found it beneficial and I hope you have a fantastic weekend. Thanks for watching.